All I was born okay. October the 24th, 1921, down on Main Street in the Miller House. I, well, it was called, uh, it was Dr. Miller's Hospital, I guess. Been living two blocks away ever since. Father built the, the Menachee Theater in 1916 and with his brother Clem Howell and another man, A.R. Moore, who had operated the uh, movie theater down, down the street there. Tell me the story about uh, the Opera House. My father was a uh, machinist. Eskel Hammond was a projectionist at the Opera House. Wanted to get married and go on a honeymoon. And I guess my father had been interested watching him crank the film. In those days, they had to stand there and crank it. And Haskell taught him how to do it. And he went off and got married. And <laughs> my dad got into the theater business. And I guess he fell for it and been in it ever since. Mr. Moore had sold the Opera House or they formed this corporation, the Menachee Theater Corporation, and uh, opened the Menachee Theater, and they had 823 seats, I think, in it. Had a balcony. They had those silent days, and they finally they got an organ, and put in a nice organ, a stage place. Uh, I don't know exactly what year it was that the, the sound came in, because I was, mm -hmm. I was probably maybe nine or ten years old and I didn't care about those things. I mean... Oh, did you have the jazz singer? The, yeah, they, I remember they played it there. It was one of the first theaters. There wasn't that many movies made, you know, at that time when they finally got it going. In my mind, it was closed for about a month. They, uh, you know, they changed the booth to put all the electronic, electric equipment for sound. And they had to build the speakers and, and very exciting for a kid. I can remember going there after, from Sunday school and, and uh, go up to the theater and watch the acts come in. And they had vaudeville on Sundays. That was the day they had it. A uh, couple of times I was backstage and rode my tricycle out and, and, and went in front of an act. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're always a showman. <laughs> yeah, I always wanted to get in, get my two cents in. I think it was like 26, just before the big crash financial crash. Yeah. The National Theater Syndicate came to town and said, we'll give you a price and we think it's a good price if you'll sell. And they said, no, we don't want to sell. We've started this thing. We're not going to sell. And they said, well, if you don't sell, we're going to build a great big one, even more majestic across the street, right from, you, you know. So they all said, well, that looks pretty good. Pretty good. That's quite a bit of money. So I, I don't know exactly what they sold it for. I know my dad says uh, he lost it all in the oh. in the market crash. He oh. invested it in stocks, and the, oh, three I, years I, later the thing went down. So oh. the, all he, all the money he made from the theater went away in the crash. Oh, no. But he was lucky because uh, the National Theaters, he was gone for about not even a week, and they got a hold of him, sent him a telegram, says, we'd like to have you as the manager of the theater, and was the manager of the theater from then on. 
And then I started, grew up there and started working in 1938 when I was 16 for 25 cents an hour, changing posters, uh, helping Richard Villeman. And we used to always go out when, on Armistice Day, which was the big day in the parade in Porto, we'd get out on the marquee at the Menachee Theater and, and watch the parade. But how did Molina come about? Well, in 1936, I was in high school, and uh, the company wanted to build another theater, so they... Was there that much need in Porterville? We were growing well, evidently and... there was another theater, but they thought there was movies were getting better, we're going to pick it up a little. So they built the Molino Theater on the corner of Division Street and Mill Street. That's an interesting thing that they did. It had, uh, it had a wood floor and it had a full basement. To get the slant on the, on the theater floor, they blocked it up and then they went around and cut it all the way around and then took uh, and put ice up underneath the floor and as the ice melted it let the whole floor real engineering achievement came down just the all the ice melted at the same temperature and it dropped the thing down and made made the slant on the floor the people would just shake their heads and think well, how could they ever do that i was taking spanish it's on mill street mill in spanish is molino and so they called it the Molino Theater and it went and fit with the Menachee Theater and the Molino Theater. So people still wanted to go see the first run movies at the... We used to bicycle prints. So we'd have to play the same show at both theaters. The, and then we also started to pick it up. We had two for one for a while. So two people come in for one price on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They gimmicks yeah, to yeah. get people to come to the show. Yeah. Right after the Molino theater opened. Well then the Crystal Theater, which was on Main Street, uh, we bought them out. But, uh, so we had three theaters. I managed it for just a short time and then the war, December the 7th, 1941 came along. I can remember opening and starting the show and going in and uh, had a little radio, which I still have at home. Uh, Turn it on the news and says Pearl Harbor was bombed today, just bombed. And uh, that was a big blow. I said, well, I'm not going to wait around and get drafted, so I went and enlisted in the Navy. I came back from the service in 19, end of 1945. My dad was just about worn out. Everybody else was gone and it was hard to get help. And there was no other entertainment but the movies. There was no television in those days. They'd sit at home and listen radio or go to the, sh go to the movies. And movies did pretty good business during the war. They were doing, they'd have war drives and, uh, you know, bond drives and stuff. And people would come to, So I went back to work when I got out. Olive started and the cotton was being picked and everything. This town was just overrun with uh, migrant workers. And they all wanted to go to the Molino Theater. 
and we did so much business at the Molina Theater. At 25, 30 cents a ticket, 10 cents for kids, and uh, 10 cents for a box of popcorn. And it was a very poor, poor day when we didn't take in around 140 or 150 dollars on the popcorn. These are B movies they're showing? Or? Yeah, a Western. Yeah, a Western. All, it always had to be yeah. a Western. Hopalong yeah. casting, <laughs> Gene Autry. The Menachi Theater, after I got out of the service for a while, they had a thing called uh, Ghost Shows. Ghost Shows? It was a, it was, all it amounted to was mainly was a magician to come up and do tricks and stuff and play hearing music and then turn out the lights and have these uh, things going around and floating them over the people and like goblin the ghost or something. And uh, they, they were really popular, people would go nuts. We had a show that did such a business at the Monachi Theater. Uh, we had to run, we had, we filled the show up and there was so many people there, they, they crowded in, they broke out the glass in the 40 by 60 frame in the lobby. It was, it was stu stupendous, it was amazing. Yeah. Where, which theater was the Mickey Mouse Club, one of the first ones? Oh, well, well we had that in, and started in 1937 or 38. Kids would sign up and when they sign up, well, they put their birthday and then we'd mail out on their birthday a free ticket to the show, which was, back in those days, was a great thing for the kids. Oh, yeah. The theater holds 800 and it always had uh, oh. maybe four or 500 kids in there. Maybe. Oh. And this is before and, Disney had a club, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, before the television. Had our club song, shine your shoes, slick your hair, come along with me. To Porterville's own Mickey Mouse Club, that's a place to be. Spread the news everywhere, listen to the band. To Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, let's give them both a hand. The three little pigs and the big bad wolf are playing piggyback. There's Donald Duck and his and Mickey Mouse and his Sunday best, and Donald Duck with his quack, 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 quack. Ring those bells, toot those horns, let the world be free. Manachi Mickey Mouse Club members, this is our big day. <laughs> I can remember when, when we decided to start going to build the Porter Theater. Movies were movies when the Porter was built. Movies. And they, they bought the property where the Porter Theater is now. That used to be the city jail, well built theater. Each one of those pillars that the arch is on goes down 16 to 17 feet and an earthquake, it's supposed to be earthquake proof because those arches bend. June 49 and then movies were movies when I, oh wait, when we, all of you, we ran the show. What happened with your dad after that? Uh, well, when we, we opened the, the Porter and he retired then, they, they tore down the, the Menachi Theater in 1958. And dad died in 1959. Mm -hmm. And he died, he walked down, he had a blocked heart, but he'd go for a walk and he walked down, it was on a Monday night, walked down and walked into Thrifty when it used to be on the corner fell over dead with a heart attack. And Kenny Clifford, who was a news broadcaster on, on uh, he started out at KTIP, but he was over at KCOK, he had the morning news. On the only corner in Porterville that he could see all the three theaters that he had started in Porterville. The Menachi Theater, the Molino Theater, and the, and the Porter Theater. I'd say 1930 to 1975, not one day in 45 years was there not a show playing in Porterville under the Howell management. I'd hire people to work at the show and say, 
uh, you mean I have to work on Christmas Day? I said, well, the show's got to go on. Somebody's got to work. You take the job, you've got to be there. In 1980, after we, five years after we triplexed the theater, mm -hmm. uh, the principal theater sold out to uh, Pacific Theaters. Oh. What do you think of the movie business today? We went to the show here a while back, and my son said, Dad, do you think that uh, you'd ever see five dollars and twenty-five cents for the cheapest bike box of golf cart you could get her. We had we had the nineteen forty-seven film, and there's so many wonderful shots of people. They would dress up to come to the theater. Oh yeah. A, well, everybody a, dressed up for everything. People say, "Oh, you're wearing a tie. I wear a tie all the time because that's natural for me." Uh, you know? <laughs>
Jim was born on October the 24th, 1921. He will be 100 years old tomorrow. He was born on charter night. His father, Everett Howell, was a charter member of this club. His son, Travis, is a member of the club. Jimmy has been a member of the club since 1956. He served with honor and distinction in the United States Navy during World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, a husband, a father, grandfather, World War II veteran, a Rotarian who has truly exemplified the Rotary motto of service above self. Ladies and gentlemen, James E. Howell.
in here, come on in here, Alexander's Ragtime Band. Come on in here, come on in here, it's the best band in the land. They can play a musical like you never heard before, so natural that you want to go to war. It's just the best band, what I am. Oh, my honey lamb, come on along, come on along, let me take you by the hand. Up to the man, up to the man, who's the leader of that band? And if you care to hear that funny river play, in right time, come on along, come on in here, Alexander's Ragtime Band.